Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yeah? All right. So uh, I'm Joel. This is Mario. We are the co-founders of Flying Fish Lab. And Flying Fish Lab is an open innovation consultancy headquartered in Singapore. Uh, what we do is very simple. We help companies, we help brands innovate and compete better. We have our own methodology called controlled disruption, and we apply it to product innovation, building more relevant and differentiated brands, go-to-market strategies, and so on. We, the company is pretty young. We just over a year. Uh, so far, uh, in a year, we've been working with uh, quite a number of uh, blue chip clients, uh, whether it's in the personal care or beauty segments uh, for Unilever globally, uh, inventing next generation of snacks for Kellogg's, uh, demonstrating the product superiority of haagen uh, in the Middle East for General Mills, or uh, new ways to market insurance to millennials for AXA, so pretty wide range of products, uh, pretty wide range of projects as well, as I say, innovation, branding, marketing with our control disruption methodology. Before setting up Flying Fish Lab, we have done a number of things, uh, uh, among which uh, a lot of work in beauty, personal care, uh, for the likes of Estee Lauder, P&G, J&J, L'Oreal, and, uh, uh, and, and, and so on, basically, uh, pretty much internationally, uh, from New York to China, uh, Singapore, Europe, and so on. So we have a bit of understanding of the category. So. Why are we here today? Uh, very simple. We, uh, with all the brands, all the clients we've been working with, uh, very often when we talk to brand owners, when we, when we talk to marketers, uh, they see their brand and their product from a very interesting and peculiar point of view. Uh, every brand, every marketer will say, you know, my, my product, my brand is very different. It is clearly superior. And of course, consumers can see that. It's very obvious because we have this ingredient, because we have this claim, and we have these benefits. It's very clear. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. If you see the world from a consumer point of view, usually this is what you see. And uh, this is an example for, for cosmetics. And you can see pretty much that whether it's a product, whether it's the claim, the benefit, the communication, you could almost swap the logos and you'd be hard pressed to say which poster is for which brand, which product is for which brand. And we see that not only in, uh, in cosmetics, we see that across all categories. Uh, this is shampoo. So this is what consumers actually see you don't feel that they see that, but when they look at what's on the market, what's on offer, they say, you know, it's a sea of sameness. It's all the same. Uh, this is basically uh, sunglasses, fashion, and we can go on with perfume. You can see the, the category codes, very strong. And even outside, this is just water. Very important to have a splash of water to show the freshness and vitality of the water you know, fueling and flowing for your body, very important. Everybody is doing it. All, these are all competitors, of course. Fast food, uh, automotive. Now, if you want to launch a new car, you know what to do. Silver, three-quarter shot. And that's the way, to, that's, the way, that's the recipe for success. So, when you look at that and say, oh my God, I hope my brand or my product is not in that sea of sameness, and I hope that consumers don't see me like completely you know, the same, drown into all this similar offering, basically. And it's a very, interest, it's a very relevant question to ask yourself because, uh, in effect, the greatest threat that you face as a brand owner it's not rejection. Because rejection, when people don't like you, at least there's an emotion, at least they react. And if you understand why they reject you, you have a chance to correct it and change their mind. 
You know, they don't like you, we can do something about it. Now maybe they will like you if you change your product, change your com, if you do something different, maybe they will like you. But there is no amount of money that will change the fact that they don't care. This is the greatest threat, it's indifference. Because here, you know what, you can change your product completely, your formulation, your distribution. I'm not even interested. I, I can't even see you. Absolutely no interest whatsoever. You cannot change indifference. This is the greatest danger, the greatest threat that you face as a company is indifference. So, you saw that sea of sameness and you might be wondering why do most companies struggle so much to differentiate? to innovate. Why is it so hard? So we have our own theory, uh, which is as valid as others. We really feel it's because of expertise. So let me qualify that. We call that industry best practices. So expertise, the knowledge you have in your industry, in your category, makes you very effective, makes you very efficient. When you create a new product, you know exactly what to do. When you launch a new product, you know exactly what to do. You know, you've been in the industry for 25 years. I know you, how you market night cream in China. There's five steps, and you must follow them in that order. It's guaranteed success. And it's great because you don't need to reinvent the wheel for every market. You don't need to reinvent the wheel for every product launch. You know, or every, uh, every new product that you develop. Expertise has a lot of strength. But there's a flip side to expertise, is that you're pretty much on autopilot. Because you know so much, you follow templates, you follow recipes, you follow formulas. And these were obviously established based on some previous successes. Maybe they are no longer relevant or valid today. Maybe there are other ways to do things but you don't necessarily question them because you're an expert, you know. And when you, don't know, when you know, you don't ask questions. So, how do we create breakthrough? Not on. Good. See this? Hello? So, it's easy to see that it's not working, but if it were so easy, we would have fixed it a long time ago. So, the obvious question is, how do we create breakthrough? And let me use an image for an analogy. Sometimes it feels like you're caught in a situation where you're facing an obstacle that seems difficult to overcome. You feel like the little guy there versus the big guy. And as you will all see, it seems as if the odds are stacked up against you. Maybe you don't have the distribution, maybe you don't have the marketing budget, whatever that dimension might be. The key thing is that we're all reading this image in the same way. And it seems as if there's only one way, sorry, mm. thank you. It seems as if there's only one way to answer this challenge. Because we have been taught that that little thing they wear around is a indication of a fight, a sumo fight. But it's a challenge. And in these circumstances, it seems unsurmountable. If I'm the small guy, it seems very difficult to achieve. And if all I do is say, yes, I want to fight you because I have to compete in this marketplace, then, of course, I can't do that. So how do we break through? And in our view, the answer lies in reframing the challenge. Who says it has to be a sumo fight? Why? do you have to compete under the rules that were established? Why? Who says? Sometimes there is a very good reason, but other times there is no reason. And reframing the challenge is about asking, why not? Could it be maybe? What if? And if you start thinking that way, you go, I don't want to fight you. You're too heavy. These rules don't suit me. So what could I do? I mean, dominoes? Nah, doesn't really work. It still has to be something physical, not just intellectual. Monopoly? Same problem. But maybe instead of fighting you, I could race you. And all of a sudden, my competitive disadvantage becomes a competitive advantage. All of a sudden, what happens is that the expected outcome from the very same problem, so there's been no change to the problem. 
but the outcome is different. And all we've done is reframe the issue. So, in order to do that, in order to keep asking why, in order to keep asking why couldn't we, in order to keep asking what if, we need that thing that young people have when they start their first job, right? They go in and they say, sorry, excuse me, madam, why do you do it this way? They have what we call intelligent naivety. It's much easier for someone who doesn't understand those rules that Joel was describing, which make you effective, which make you very efficient. It's much easier for someone to ask, why do I have to hail a taxi in the street like this? I have a phone. I could just look it up, right? Couldn't I? Today it's called Uber, but 10 years ago it could have been done. No one did it until someone said, why do I have to call a taxi in the street? You need intelligent naivety to help you reframe the challenge you're facing. Thank you. And for us, that's very hard to do from the internal expert perspective. It's a lot easier to do if you're an outsider. If you don't understand the category rules, if you don't understand the complexity, if you do not understand the constraints, because some of them need to be questioned. And so the way we think you can solve the problem in our opinion, is to combine the three ways in which you might ever solve a problem. And we'll explain this in a bit more detail. But basically, there are three ways in which you might solve a problem. One is to ask outsiders, people who don't know your company, don't know your category, don't understand. And they'll have lots of stupid ideas. But among these, you find some interesting ones that will be thought-provoking. Another way to solve that is to bring in people from different disciplines, people from different functions, and to combine people who are more numerically inclined or more R&D with people who are more artistic or more whatever design. Bring all those people together and see by thinking differently, that's cross-functional work. The last way in which you could solve a problem is to give it to an expert and say, you're the expert on flavoring, tell me how I could do this. But if you combine these three approaches, Whilst this isn't a guarantee of a magic bullet, in our view, it gives you the best chance of finding breakthrough. And for each of these, and Joel will start by explaining the first one, which is the outside in, we believe that crowdsourcing is a great way to bring in outside in thinking. We actually believe that you then need to push that. And there is a set of tools that are very useful to that, which is challenge your thinking. And the last piece is about allowing the silo work to take place and to bring value into the process. So, so let's start with uh, outside in. So outside in, it's great, thank you. I know not to go to that corner. <laughs> Learn fast. Uh, outside in is really about getting people involved who don't necessarily know about your category, about your industry. So they don't, because they are not experts, they are free to ask the questions that you are no longer asking therefore to see a problem from very different perspectives that you see your own problem. Therefore, they are more likely to come up with original solutions. Simple as that. And there are many ways to get outside in thinking. One of the ways we are particularly fond of is through crowdsourcing. So I'm going to, apologies for those who are very familiar with the term crowdsourcing, for those who are not, it's very simple. There are a number of platforms out there, online communities, with a lot of members who love to solve creative challenges. So it's online uh, or uh, on mobile, you know, tablet. And these platforms, basically, brands organize contests, competitions, to get creative ideas. Simple as that. So it's an online contest where you are given a challenge as a member of a community and given a deadline to submit a solution. And the best ideas get rewarded, usually with cash prizes. You get money for the best ideas. That's basically an uh, over, uh, overview of what crowdsourcing is about and how it works. So there are a number of platforms out there, a number of online com communities that you can tap into to get these outside-in perspectives. Uh, Oops. These are examples of what you could get through crowdsourcing. This is you can, uh, a project that we've done uh, 
actually in, uh, in, in cultured meat, uh, yogurts for, for a New Zealand uh, company. So you can get product ideas as simple as sketches, you know, rough drawings with some explanations. If you, cha if you challenge it, say, I'm looking for a new way for people to consume yogurts, you know, which is more fun, more innovative. So then you get a lot of thinking behind that. You can get more sophisticated platforms where the creators will spend a little bit more time, uh, really think through the solution, uh, what, what's the target consumer, what's the problem they are really trying to fix, and then some platforms really go full length into very complex, complicated products. They can solve very technical challenges, think about distribution, uh, you know, point of sales, user experience, interfaces. You know, it's really, really thorough. Obviously, these platforms, the projects take, you know, different, uh, different length. So simpler, shorter, cheaper, more complex challenges. It will take a lot more time uh, and it will be, a lot, it'll be more expensive. But the output that you get is obviously very, very different. So there is an art and a science in, first of all, when doing crowdsourcing is which platform do I choose based on the makeup of their community, based on the skills, and just based on the output I'm looking for. Maybe, you know, if I want to drive, you know, for one kilometer to go my shopping, I don't need a Rolls Royce, you know. Uh, a Skoda or, or a Honda will do. I don't need to pay so much. So you actually have a choice to pick the best platforms for your project. The one thing to consider when you organize a, a, a contest on a crowdsourcing platform to get that intelligent naivety, that fresh thinking, is that people who participate are not professionals of your industry. Therefore, they don't understand your jargon. Therefore, they cannot solve very technical problems. More often, they come from uh, backgrounds such as they are graphic designers, product designers, illustrators, or we get you know, architects or even housewives you know, who like to draw and have a lot, lot of ideas. But they use this platform as a channel you know, to express their creativity. But what they don't understand is the chemical, the formulation, the cost of the ingredients, what is saved, you know, how does it work. It's no point giving them a challenge that has all these parameters because they won't get it. So you need to be able to digest and simplify your challenge. And one of the best ways to do it is imagine that you're just meeting someone in a bus and you're going to explain in one sentence what you want them to do so they could participate and give you some good feedback or good input. If you can do that in one sentence in plain English, then you know that your project is likely to be a success because at least everyone will understand it. There is a, a, a platform that we like to use very much called Jovoto. Uh, it's based in Germany, but it's pretty international. There are members all over the world. And this is a typical participant. His name is Tommaso. By day, he's an architect. That's his job. But he really wanted to be a product designer. So in the evenings, on the weekends, he participates in crowdsourcing contests to s solve product design challenges. And he's, in his own words, why does he participate? It's not for the money, because if there are 200 submissions to a project, there's only one prize where you're more likely to lose than to win. So most people don't participate for the money. They participate because they want to express their creativity. They want to have fun. They want to progress. I'm an architect. I love to learn about product design. So the more project, uh, product designs projects I participate in, the more I learn, the more I, I, I sharpen my skills. And if you can give me feedback, you as a respected marketing or product designers or expert, it's extremely valuable because it allows me to grow. So when you actually prepare this kind of project, it's very important to think of a win-win situation. You cannot give people a task. I want you to do that. That's it. It has to be something where they get something out of the project as well a bit of a freedom to create, a freedom to express themselves, some learning. So you have to think of that win-win scenario to increase the likelihood of participation to your project. Because on these platforms, all the projects compete one with each other. So the, the members of a community will see your project among many of the projects and choose to spend their weekends on your project or not, or on another project. So you have to make your projects appealing enough. Uh, 
Typically, if everything goes well, if you got a good brief, uh, good participation, you will get a lot of entries, a lot of solutions. So they will be in the form of visuals with some explanations. This is my idea, this is why it's great. And then basically the hard work begins. These are usually not solutions. At least we don't consider them as such. We, we use crowdsourcing as a source of inspiration for our next step. But really, before we can actually before it's fit for purpose, before we can actually use that for our next step as a source of inspiration, there's a lot of hard work to try to make sense of the solutions proposed by the community. Very often someone will have a great idea, but unfortunately they can't express it well. So you have to be able to almost reverse engineer and say, well, he thinks that his idea is so-so, but actually it's brilliant, but he focused on the wrong part. If I had focused his explanation on this part, everybody will have get it. So you need to spend a lot of time going through each idea that you receive, try to understand what is the insight, basically what is the need that's driving that solution? Because they are very often they say, here's my solution. Okay, great, but what problem are you solving? So you need to do that reverse engineering yourself, make sense of the entries, analyze them, and then format them, see really the potential, and then suddenly you have a very rich source of stimuli for a next step in our innovation process. Okay. So there might be different ways in which you want to take this stimuli forward, but we have a point of view, and in our experience what works is to bring in the team, the cross-functional team, and to take them through these ideas, as Joel was just explaining. Here's what's interesting about this idea. Here's an, an insight that's intriguing. Here's a product concept that's really very different. How you decide to use that, there will be a number of different ways. We're very fond of a particular way, which is leveraging, there we go, sorry, I have a button issue here, which is leveraging um, on thinking from a book that came out in the late 90s, a gentleman called Adam Morgan, who invented the whole concept of challenger brands. And so the, the whole idea behind it is that challenger brands can't compete in the same way as the established players, as the category. They're looking for different ways to do that. In a nutshell, it's about learning how challengers do it and applying it to our brands. It's essentially a lateral thinking toolbox. Okay? The whole challenger thinking piece is a lateral thinking toolbox. So it's not a state of market. It is a state of mind. One of the favorite quotes we have is Phil Knight, the founder of Nike, who says, we are the industry Goliath, and we will stay that way by acting and thinking like the industry David. We're number one because we think like a number two. Because the minute you think you're number one, you become complacent. You stop challenging yourself. And that's really the ethos of what challenger thinking is all about. Um, it's more than having a brand name. It's having a point of view. Because just saying what the category says doesn't set you apart. But when you have a purpose, and that is to fight for inclusive beauty, because we don't care if it's a man dressed up as a woman, we think that that's what cosmetics do. They allow everyone to express themselves. Then that's why MAC Cosmetics has a, a very strong point of view as a brand. So we won't go into this today in detail, but there's a whole eight credos. The first one, attitude and preparation, is about intelligent naivety. And that's where the crowdsourcing plays a role. But we then take that further into the team. Because as Toms of Maine says, as a challenger, success means never letting the competition define you. Why are you looking at what your competitors are doing? Just because someone else is doing it doesn't mean that it's right. Oops, sorry. Keep the wrong oh, I'm having a button here. Thanks. Or as Benefit of San Francisco found out a long time ago, there's no point trying to copy whoever the market leader is. People are happy with them. So be yourself. Don't try to be someone else. That's not going to work. Sorry. So we're taught that experience is a good thing, but
but it's actually the inexperienced who see opportunity. Let me maybe try to bring this to life. We think that people need to learn to outlook, and that's what we bring into the sessions that we run, and that's kind of what we suggest might work. Typical work that we do in terms of any brand or, or, or any manufacturer, you'll look at your category, your competition, and your consumer, right? Nothing wrong with that. The thing is that this is about the status quo. That's the current landscape as you know it. If you're looking at innovation, you want to look forward. That doesn't say anything about where are we going or where might opportunity lie that describes the existing landscape. So how do we see opportunity? And we've got a little film here for you to illustrate the point. This is a story about curiosity, about seeing opportunity where others don't. This is Ingvard Kamprad, the founder of IKEA. He is walking through a crowded meat market, staring at the stalls packed full of chickens, rows and rows and rows of plucked chickens. To the casual observer, there's nothing of interest in this familiar scene. In fact, you could argue that there is no less inspiring sight than row after row of cold, dead, plucked chickens. They are simply there, laid bare, unimaginative, unfeeling and ugly. But Camprad is intrigued and inspired by the stool in front of him. Because although on the surface he sees exactly what everyone else sees, he also sees something they don't, something absent. And eventually he asks the question, what do you do with all the feathers? And what he discovers is that the chicken sellers have no use for the feathers, and so they throw them away. And so where others see dead chickens, Camprad sees an opportunity. An opportunity to take the feathers that are being thrown away and to use them to make and sell millions of IKEA feather duvets at prices well below duck and goose. A win for the customer and an innovative new business opportunity for IKEA. Ingvar wasn't looking at what IKEA was doing or what IKEA's competitors were doing. He was looking beyond, beyond the category, beyond his current consumer set, beyond his competitive set, just looking outside, exploring, intelligently naive. So what Challenger Thinking brings us, as I said in the beginning, is a toolbox of exercises that allows us to reframe our challenge over and over again. And if you're a little bit familiar with design thinking, the whole principle be behind design thinking is the opposite to our scientific and mathematical modern day education system, which is one and one is two. There are no third answers, there's only one answer. Lateral thinking, by contrast, has a number of multiple options. There isn't one right answer. And so, we could look at overlaying the rules of another category onto ours. That's what Lush did. They took the categories of delicatessen, groceries, and applied it to cosmetics. It's not right, it's not wrong. It's one possible solution. There might be a thousand different others. Or if you take a new emotion and you insert a new emotion into your category. And I can just top of mind think of an example like AXA where we injected provocation and I guess I'm jumping some slides. Um, we worked not you know, recently with, with a, a brand in this area and Lux targets women, very obviously. Lux is all about femininity. One of the exercises that we run is hyper-targeting. So this exercise is interesting because it explores how you can find new opportunities by looking at niche audiences and where they have needs that actually are applicable to the wider consumer set that you have. So in the case of Lux, which was women, and their brand is primarily about adding femininity to women, we interrogated ourselves, okay, how could we use this exercise? So, who needs a touch of femininity the most? Women are feminine, some more, some less, but they are feminine by nature. 
It's men who are trying to become feminine, who have nothing to start from. They're trying to make a complete transition. Transgenders, okay? We don't want to sell to transgenders, that's fine. This is still only ideation. We're stretching our thinking. The whole point of this, these exercises is not to find the one plus one is two, is to explore possibilities. So let's stay on this line. What would it mean to create a product for transgender consumers? Ah, all of a sudden, we identified opportunities that are very interesting and that are equally applicable to women. That's what's interesting about it. It isn't that we're trying to sell to transgenders, it's that we've used this as a mechanism to identify opportunities that have appeal to a wider audience. But we've used a very, very small target that is so well defined that we could have some very concrete ideas about it. Or, as I was saying earlier, what if we injected a new emotion into a category? Insurance. At best, you feel indifferent to it. Probably at worst, you hate it. What if we wanted insurance to be provocative? What would that mean? That puts you in a different frame of mind, which creates new opportunities. Or what if you took a very serious engineering-oriented German brand and tried to overlay the rules and conventions of what makes ice cream successful? What kinds of products would you create? If all of a sudden I'm thinking of headphones as I think of ice cream. If all of a sudden I use what makes ice cream exciting to make headphones exciting. I will guarantee you a lot of rubbish will come out of this but also a lot of interesting stuff, and we do it for the latter. Or one last example, for someone who's stuck in a dairy conundrum and I'm selling milk and yogurt and thinking of supermarkets, what if your company were taken over? So what if someone bought you and all of a sudden they don't understand your category, they know nothing about cosmetics or they know nothing about dairy in this case but they run a very successful business in retail selling teddy bears. $400 million of it, by the way, not too bad, not too shabby, and it's primarily sold through an experience. How could we use their thinking to help us create new products? So what the Challenger Thinking piece does, essentially, is it helps you stretch the basis that you've already got from the crowdsourcing. So what we see that works really well is if you have to inject the intelligent naivety into the team, immerse them into it, and then use the challenger thinking to expand your possibilities. So from whatever it is, 50, 100 ideas that you can get from the crowdsourcing, your team can usually stretch that to some four to 800 ideas. That's pushing the boundaries. It's not the solution, it's exploring possibilities. You then need to bring that back, but that's what we all do naturally. The next step, to kind of bring this into a concept, into a product concept or into a service concept, is what we naturally tend to do. Oh, this ingredient, that packaging, we can put this together, great. That's what you do naturally. It helps, in our experience, to bring in some visualizers. Again, design thinking. More than half of our brain is hardwired to decode visuals. We can write words on paper, it's not the same thing. So if you walk out with one piece of advice, in case you don't already have it in your heads, is bring your ideas to life visually as soon as possible. It'll be a lot easier for you to discuss and then decide what you think should be taken forward or what shouldn't. Now, in most cases, we see a lot of clients stop here and run forward go, great, let's go and test this with consumers. In our view, that is a bit too early. You've just had the idea. They're not ready. So it's, it's a newborn baby, it can't run, can't walk. So why are you taking them into market testing? You haven't thought about the consequences of these, maybe you can't make them. So there's a final step, which is where, in our view, you need some silo work. I need my packaging guy to tell me if this is or isn't possible. Basically, we think it makes perfect sense, and it's a necessity even, to dedicate some time with the existing resources you have within your businesses. Allow your team to think through the implications of those concepts. Give them a little bit of time and go, okay, John, go away and come back in two weeks and tell me, can we do this? 
And if not, tell me how we can do it, rather than I can't do this because I don't want to know why it can't be done. I want to know how it can be done. Joel, it's going to take $200 million of capex if you're going to do this, okay? I know what it takes. I might choose not to take it, but I know what it takes. So, sorry, let me skip through to the more visual. What we suggest at this stage is that you need to download everyone's point of view. This is R&D, this is supply chain, this is packaging, this is sales, all of the functions. Allow each of them to think through the implications. Bring back the team together. Download everybody's point of view. I don't care what anyone else thinks. From a marketing perspective, this is how I see it. I don't care what you say. From a packaging perspective, this is how I see it. I don't care what you packaging and marketing guys say. R&D says, we can't do this, whatever you guys want to say. The ingredients haven't been invented. If I have 10 years and 2 billion, I can invent it. Okay, we don't have 10 years. That's fine. But this is where you have that discussion. And you've got all the people in the room. You've identified the issues. This is a very simple device anyone can do, which is a traffic light system. As people are sharing, you capture it on Post-its, and then you address it. Maybe there's some great opportunities. So you tackle it, you take it forward. There, maybe there's some barriers, you fix them. You do a basic assessment in terms of feasibility, cost, timeline, and you'll be able to put a plan together. Such a process would probably take you about six to eight weeks in total. From I need to do something with innovation in lipstick, BB cream, I don't know what I'm doing in my category, to I have a plan, in six to eight weeks. That's a little bit faster than I think most processes work. So, maybe an example to bring it to life? That's a project we've done for, for Sennheiser. Um, oops. Do you mind clicking? It doesn't work. Thank you. Uh, actually, we can skip that. Obviously, we have a happy client, otherwise I wouldn't present it, be presenting that today. Uh, the, the challenge is around uh, business travelers. Uh, Sennheiser, in the premium headphones category, you have Bose, which is the market leader, uh, especially in the US. You have Sony, which is not bad as well, across the world, especially in Asia and Europe. And then you have Sennheiser. And uh, they were looking, basically, to shake up a bit the, the, the market with a pipeline of new products, specifically targeting business travelers, people who fly or people in, who commute by train to work you know, and travel a lot. So first step is outside in. And we source intelligent naivety from the crowd, work with uh, an online platform, Jovoto. In a space of 21 days, we got 61 very thorough ideas that served as a base for inspiration, for stimuli, for our cross-functional workshop. So we have are some examples of what we can get from cloud sourcing. Uh, to be anything from uh, modular headphones, you can actually completely customize, change, inc including whether it's in-ear, uh, over the ear, uh, whatever different format based on different moments, different occasions. Um, you have uh, different um, ways as well, you know, cheaper models, different ways actually to grip, and you could actually separate the headband from the headphones as well. And and you or things which are a bit more surprising, such as a new controller, a new device where you can interact with the headphones in the form of a ring, uh, which could be used to control other electronic devices as well. And it could become almost like a status symbol, you know, you have a Sennheiser ring or not. Um, so you can see basically the, the depth as well of thinking behind each entry. And we've, what we've done as well is to go through, understand the insights, what does it mean, where are the opportunities, and that's what basically we bring to the workshop. Uh, so the crowdsourcing, so we start the workshop usually with talking about, you know, some insights, what do we know about our consumers, the challenge, getting a bit of inspiration and share knowledge among the team members. Uh, then go for the crowdsourcing entries, which are also available on the wall for people to view in more details, to do a bit of a walkabout. Um, and we run our challenger thinking exercises. Uh, so as Mario explained, can we borrow the codes of uh, ice cream, and what will happen if we apply that to premium headphones, about the fun, the colors, uh, going back to your childhood, very, very emotional territory. Uh, what happened if we were to think like super yacht manufacturer, where you can customize absolutely everything, 
I want everything decked in pink leather. Yet it can be done if you can, if you can afford. So if we go into an Uber premium, extremely bespoke, what type of new products would we invent? So these are all lateral thinking exercises designed to stop thinking about headphones, stop being an expert, let's do some role play, pretend that you are solving different problems in a different category for someone else and you're going to come up with breakthrough that you can apply to your category. Um, another example, hyper-targeting. We can only sell to kawaii Japanese girls. That's it, which is quite a step uh, removed from our, our, our businessmen. Other one, uh, we can only target road warriors. Performance, high tech, very masculine. What happened if suddenly our CEO was replaced and Bjork, an Icelandic singer who is very known for eccentricity, took charge of a company? What would she change? Or what, what happened if we were taken over by Lego? They know nothing about headphones, but they know a lot about you know, playfulness and imagination and creativity, simplicity, modularity. What type of products would they invent if they were in charge? Or if Google were to board us? They manage to make themselves so incredibly useful to everything we do. They permeate almost all aspects of our life. What, could, what products could we invent? Thinking like Google. So these exercises, you can see some of the output here, uh, typically will generate four, five, 800 ideas in, in one afternoon, in one morning, with a team of about 20 people. Uh, so it, for that workshop, we got 620 ideas. So you got stimuli, which is the crowdsourcing. You got all the knowledge share on the inside about the brand, and you got 620 ideas that you play f that you play with. This is designed to push the thinking as much as possible to the point where it becomes uncomfortable, and you say, oh, "That's nonsense. No, that doesn't make any sense. I don't want to play anymore." Then we're getting somewhere. And then what we do is that we bring it together now, but we push the stretch of thinking. We're going to create concepts, and concepts we work in pairs. Basically, and that's where we think about product based on inspired by that crowdsourcing ID and this ID we had on a post-it. I'm going to put them together and create a great product ID, which is defined as what's the insight, what's the benefit we offer to consumers, what's the reason to believe, what are the features, what is it, why is it a good brand fit, what does it work for Sennheiser or for your brand? And basically, we have a template. You know, people fill that template, create the product, and bring that to illustrators, which are in all our workshops, because it's very, very important when you conduct such workshops as well. Uh, half of our brain is hardwired to decode visuals. So pictures, that's how, we, that's how we function as human beings. So having a verbal expression, articulation of your concept, and a visual one makes all the difference for to be able to share and for people to understand and see the potential of your ID. Make sure you have also a, a drawing, a sketch. Uh, and then we create, we do a few rounds, and then we shortlist, we vote, we discuss, we like to vote up, we like to vote down. It creates a lot of interesting tensions and discussions. Why don't you like my idea? I thought it's great, you know? And then we shortlist that to a manageable number of concepts that you can safely take within your innovation pipeline internally, 8, 10, 12. And that's where we go into the greenhousing and say, great, now we have a shortlist. We're all confident about that. What are the implications? What does it mean from a packaging standpoint, from an experience standpoint, from a functionality, from a manufacturing, from a route to market? I want each of the experts, the silo, to assess, stress test, identify the problems, and don't say no. No, no, it cannot be done, it's too expensive. No, no, we tried before. We must say yes if. Yes, we can do it if you give me enough money to retool this machine, if we manage to acquire that IP from that partner or that license. So we know what's possible, and the concepts are much, you know, much, much richer, and now they are in pretty good shape to be actually be tested with consumers, because we thought of all the implications. The outcome of the project, uh, so crowdsourcing project to this workshop, uh, 622 IDs, 61 crowdsource IDs, resulted in 43 concepts, which were narrowed down to five core uh, NPD IDs, which were presented and accepted by the global board, uh, and taken into immediate R&D. You say that's, you know, we, we're going to build that. Uh, and one concept is uh, we managed to get a legal patent on it because it's uh, so novel. Nobody is actually doing that. Obviously, it's none of the ones we <laughs> actually show. So just to conclude our talk, it's very simple. 
And if you have one thing to remember, the next time you're thinking of creating a new product or renovating your existing portfolio of products as well, there is more than one way to go about it. There are many different ways to work. You can get the outside in, you know, outside in thinking, people who don't know anything about your products, about your category, and it's great to get them on board because they are the ones looking to come up with very uh, divergent, lateral thinking, left field solutions. And this is where disruption and breakthrough happen. So get the outsiders. Getting the cross-functional work, the different departments, packaging can work with R&D, can work with uh, consumer insights and legal, and when they work together, you know, it can create magic using you know, a lot of exercises to obviously to force them to think differently, so you are no longer an expert, but think outside your category. Uh, and then lastly, there's a lot of merit as well in silo thinking, which is a bad word, you know, nobody wants to be a silo, but silo thinking is great because this is where you put your expert cap on and say, I can foresee problems, but the good news is thank you for inviting me to participate since the beginning because I've identified the problems, we can correct them today as opposed to six months down the line where you started already investing in the, to the concept. So you have different ways of doing innovation and as we stated before, the best way, the winning way is when you actually combine these three ways together. This is where you have the highest chances, you cover all the bases, you have the highest chances to come up with truly disruptive product ideas. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.